Okay, um, so I'm going to be talking about brand recognition in real life photos. And I also wanted to show you how easy it, is, it can be done in Python, how a few lines of code uh, you need to do some uh, powerful things. Uh, so a few words about me. I am a machine learning engineer in uh, Samsung, in R&D in Warsaw. And I'm also a founder of an organization called Human the Heart. It's a similar organization as PyData, but much smaller. And we talk about um, intersection of humanities and technology. So my project started in data science retreat. It's a course, three months course here in Berlin. Um, and the assum assumption of this course is that you go there to become a better data scientist. And you start by learning data science, uh, data science things, and then you, uh, from the half of the course, you start to do your own uh, project. Uh, and I wanted to do something with social media uh, and with images. So I decided for Instagram. Um, can I ask you how many of you use Facebook and Instagram? Only four persons, five. And Snapchat? The same as Instagram. This is shocking. Um, yeah, because, you know, Facebook is much more popular in general, but yeah, you can see um, Instagram um, numbers from the official website. So it's enormous numbers, 300 millions of active users monthly, 30 billions of photos, and two and a half billion likes every day. So it's enormous scale. But the most interesting statistics is here in the, in the bottom. Uh, it's about followers engagement brand. And followers engagement uh, is about that you have some followers as a brand, and how many of those followers are actually engaging this brand by likes, comments, shares, uh, anything. So how many of them are actually active? And you see this huge difference between Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Huge difference. So Instagram is for brands. But of course, don't forget that Instagram is owned by Facebook from a few years. So one of the problems uh, you have in Instagram as a brand is that it has a huge noise of information. So these are the pictures. Uh, when you will type uh, hashtag Nike in the Instagram, you will get those images. Of course, other also, but you also find get free followers, some panda images, some random products images, Lego. Because when you want to be visible on Instagram, you just put every popular hashtag and you're just everywhere on Instagram. So another thing is that uh, if you would imagine what Instagram sees as a system, so it sees your hashtags, it's, it sees your comments and texts, but it doesn't know what's inside the picture. So from the perspective of, of the system, of the software, this is what's visible by the infrastructure. And that's why I wanted to do the, um, to be more conscious about what's in the, in the, in the pictures. So that, that's why brand recognition in real life photos. And one of the um, things you could use it for is that uh, companies that are monitoring brands in internet are more and more popular. They're doing enormous amount of money. Like this is a popular case. So someone just writes in the uh, Twitter here, I heard Virgin Mobile. And someone from Virgin Mobile just tracks the internet, scrapes all the internet, text, text data. And they can respond by you know, giving some free tickets and they get the customer back. But it's all about text. And with brand recognition, you could do the same with visual data. So you could, for example, sp spot some uh, image. And of course, to, use, um, to, to solve the problem with images, the best thing you can use is deep learning right now. Uh, how many of you used deep learning for some problems? OK, all right, some of you. So the problems uh, you can uh, spot is that you need ridicul ridiculous amount of data. So you need hundreds of thousands of data to train a network. And it's hard to train because it takes a lot of time. It's, uh, it can take weeks, months to train your network without any results. And the good things is that it has the best results in image recognition problems. And the best thing is that it learns features itself. So I didn't know anything about 
uh, normal image recognition, like you know, a visual bag of words, looking for some particular features like edges, contrast. I didn't know about it, and I didn't have to because deep learning learns everything itself. And in this type of problems, you have um, three approaches done mostly in academia. So the first approach is that when you have um, your, when your data set is about a few thousands per one sample, so it's okay, you can just make more from this by adding some noise, by doing random crops in these images, so you can artificially make more images and try to train your own network. Another approach is that you don't have so many photos and you can try and pr uh, use someone network, so for example Google's network, Oxford's network, there are lots of networks to download, and use SVM on top of it or use this pre-trained network and only train the last layers which are responsible for the classification problem. And you use this approach when the network was trained for different problems. So for example, it was a network trained for classifying dogs and you're trying to find some cancer tissue. So you use this, but when the problem is similar, you use this. So this is what I used. And um, I will show you some lines of code. So this is only one line of code that will load powerful deep, learn deep learning network from downloaded from the internet. It's a VGDS network from Oxford. And it's only one line of code and you have this powerful machine. Uh, thing you have to do when you have some someone's network is to al also you always have to prepare a function like this that will prepare format of the image because this network was prepared for a particular format, so it has a uh, um, size of 224 pixels and uh, it has uh, red, green, blue in particular order, so we have to uh, switch everything. So don't try to compile this code with your eyes, but it's only about preparing the proper format of the data, and that's it. And when you want to use SVM, it's another one line from scikit-learn. That's it. So. Of course, the problem is that the brand, when you took a real image, not like, you know, I, I can zoom on some particular logotype and just take it photo, but normal people just uh, take photo and the brand is a small part of the image. That's why you have to use some technique for it and I use sliding window. So you just take small parts of the image and you go through the image and try every small part if the brand is there. And I used it very, um, because I needed a speed because I wanted to use it on a bigger scale on the Instagram, to use it fast. So normally you could use hundreds of those windows, but I wanted to do, it, to do it fast, so I only have 16 windows of width one third of the original width, the blue one, and nine windows of width one second, and also the whole Instagram picture. So I checked for every Instagram image, I checked 26 uh, images. And of course, the, the biggest problem is the data set. So I had to collect the data set myself. And to learn the network, I had to, to learn the SVM, I had to learn it only on logotypes. So I had to cut them from every Instagram image I had. So I spent manually, I think, about seven hours just cropping it uh, from the images. And this is what I collected. So you see, I have six type of classes. And those classes are counterparts. So I have um, Nike and Adidas. Um, it's Starbucks and Costa Coffee and Heineken and Carlsberg. And you do those counterparts uh, because if you would train it only on, for example, Adidas shoes, probably it will see every shoe as an Adidas shoe. So you have to differentiate it. And of course, you have those six classes, but you don't want your network to classify everything as a brand, because not everything in this world is brand. So you have to have this random class, and to random class you put just random things from the, from the Instagram. So I told you the speed was the very important thing for me. So the first network I tried gave me two seconds per one image, one single image. Uh, then I tried this network from Oxford. I recommend it to you, to you if you would use some deep learning because it's very fast and very efficient, VGGS network. And it gave me one second per image. Then I tried to optimize some code because I used someone's code and I tried to change it. And it gave me 200 milliseconds. And then 
I used Kafe framework because I started using lasagna and then I switched to Kafe, which is uh, really hard to configure. It takes a day to configure Kafe on your machine, but then it gave me only 20 milliseconds per image, so it's very fast. Um, so why do you need the neural network here? The only goal is to take your Instagram image, and image is a data structure, right? It's a, it's a 224 um, width, 224 height uh, image, and three channels, red, green, blue, so it's uh, uh, this amount of numbers. And you want to have, and every point is a feature. So it's a really huge amount of features to your model, especially that you have only a few hundreds of uh, data points. So you want to make it, make it smaller. And that's why you use the network. And by forwarding your image through the network, you get a really great representation of this image, much smaller, because it's only 496 uh, numbers. So it's much smaller data that is describing your image. And to do it, another um, piece that I wanted to show you, uh, but don't try to, another time, don't try to comp uh, compile it by your eyes. It's only, I want to show you the single steps. You only prepare your image. So the first code I was showing you to prepare the format. So to crop it, to change the RGB. Um, you add it to a batch because usually those frameworks uh, are working in batches. So you don't put one image, but for example, 10 images. So you prepare a batch. And then here, the most important, so here you put the data inside the network. And here, when you have the batch ready, batch of 10, I have a batch of 10, you just type forward, it's a function forward, it's ready, and you get the representation of your image. And this is deep learning, this is it. And that's how you uh, prepare your training set. Very easy. And then, how do you use SVM? You just put your data from which, which you got from neural network to the classifier from SVM. And that's it. This is the whole pipeline. Um, to, another thing to keep in mind is that in this, in this kind of problems, your training set and testing set is different because training pictures are zoomed in logos and as a testing set that you want to get some numbers as results you just test it on full images so you have to prepare it separately so this is my first pipeline so you're getting features from network so you get those uh, 4000 long vectors you put them to SVM as features and you use the sliding window to check every place for a brand and this very simple wor workflow, as a, and uh, maybe a few lines of code more than I showed, gave me this kind of results. So you see how powerful those uh, algorithms are. And uh, the m most important code is here, and it's the like uh, I think is the uh, only code that used some uh, something more than just uh, changing the data data from one column to other column. So you just here you're just putting the, um, getting the one image and getting windows, 26 windows from the image and putting inside the network. So here you just get the representation of those windows from sliding windows. You just put them to SVM and SVM gives you prediction for every window. The default class for you is random. And then here you just check which of the class has the highest probability and you set it as the best class. And this is it. So now thinks how you can improve your results. So my network in the beginning, um, for example, learned that every mm, green thing is a Heineken. Because I don't know why, but on Instagram, Carlsberg appear uh, often as cans and Heineken as bottles. So every green color like this was Heineken. Um, every cafeteria were uh, Starbucks because I don't know why, but Costa Coffee was often outside of cafeteria and Starbucks was inside cafeteria. So I had to add cafeteria photos. And of course, shoes like this. Also, uh, Adidas uses much more on Instagram. There are much more other clothes uh, than shoes in Adidas. And when you check Nike hashtag, it will be mainly shoes. 
I don't know why. So I just put another um, some some part of uh, pictures with shoes, but not without brand. And this improved, only adding some pictures like this improved my results for, for precision for 2%. Another thing is that you have this uh, network. It's, it's not the network I used, but you know, it's a representation of uh, how networks looks like. And you use it for taking representation of images. So you could, I was taking it from here, but you can also take it from here, from here. You, could, can, you can get output from any layer you want. So I was also testing with different layers and it gave me another 3% uh, result. And how you do it, you just, in this line, you're just switching the layer you're getting output from. So another no, almost no code to, to check it. Another thing is probability cutoff. So you can uh, adjust the um, confidence the system has to have to classify the image. So when you want your network to be really precise, to be confident that this is, for example, Nike, uh, you can just change it that if it's not confident for 92%, you are not taking its prediction. So if it's uh, confident for 90%, you just say it's a random class. If it's confident uh, more than 92%, you take the prediction. And you see another improvement in results. And you, uh, what you have to do in code, only you have, when you had this classify image function, you just add this. So it, you, you just add some number and you add it to if. So if it's more than 92 and that's it. This is adjusting probability cutoff. So having this first um, version of all the pipeline, I could use it against some data and by this to classify more data. So I get some, uh, I got it's like thousands of images classified by my, by my pipeline. And then again, manually, I was just checking if uh, here it was good, it, if he was not good, just taking false positives and false negatives. And um, just to take more uh, examples per every cl class. So I just increased the amount of examples by 500 per class. So it was not lo no, no longer 300 per one class, but 800 per one class. So much more, more data. And you see the much more data is the best thing you can get for your results because it was plus four and plus plus six and plus three percent more in results. Mm, another thing is data documentation. So when you just don't have any source of additional images and you want to artificially make more, so you can, for example, demorph the pictures to look some different. You can add some noise, or you can just crop the images in random places. And this gave me plus two and plus two percent. And another how to do uh, how to do it with Python? You just resize the images and you just take the crop. I just took a crop in every corner, so upper left corner, upper right corner, and so on. And this code makes my data set four times bigger. Uh, another thing uh, which I found in papers mainly is the small trick that you should just add normalization here. So you just normalize the data you, you, you take from here and you see the huge increase here. And on, another time the code you take preprocessing from scikit-learn, only one line of code to do it. So it was my final um, form of my pipeline. And now, when I was using it against some, um, some uh, Instagram hashtag, so I, for example, type coffee, and I was looking for Starbucks coffees, and asking my classifier to classify me only Starbucks coffee, it would give me, give me these results. It was first results uh, classified by my, by my classifier. So you see, it, was, it failed only one time here, uh, classifying some um, coffee cup as Starbucks. But rest of them, for example, when you look uh, here, the Starbucks logo is here and it was recognized somehow. So these are my final results. Um, this is the overall results for six class, but it doesn't mean much because you see how different is it for different brands. And you can imagine why, because uh, Adidas logo is only three stripes and you have uh, 
For example, I see um, someone have their um, T-shirt with uh, only white stripes, and these white stripes would be recognized as Adidas, for example. And when someone is a when somewhere uh, is a swoosh like Nike logo type, it could be recognized as Nike. And brands like Heineken and, Car and Carlsberg are much more complicated, much more complex, so they are much more easy to recognize by classifier. So if you would like to use, for, use it, for example, commercially, it depends from the brand. Some brands can use it, some not. And here you can see some tough examples. So for example, here you see a classical Nike. It's a Nike logo here. Um, here you see how Nike can have a different form from different perspective. Because we can imagine that it's Nike, but now it's more like an L sign, you know, it doesn't look like Nike and it should be recognized. Every bottle, of course, were recognized as a beer because I had much, many, many beer bottles in my data set. This thing, it looks like a Starbucks logo, but it's not. And of course, because machine learning is about patterns, it's not recognized as a Starbucks logo. But some people could confuse it. This again looks like Nike, and we know that it's some, uh, something about Nike brand, but it's not recognized as Nike. This is classic Adidas stripes. This is Heineken because it's green. And this is interesting because I found that um, pictures like this are recognized as Carlsberg. Maybe you know why? Yeah, because Carlsberg has a label, words, word Carlsberg in its logo. And, every, uh, and it begins from Carl. And that's where, why Carl was al always Carlsberg. Okay, so that's it. That's that's how you can you can make deep learning yourself. It's very easy. So if you have some questions, you would you would like to use it for your problems. Just uh, I'm waiting waiting for some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excuse me? When you normalize the photos at the beginning, uh, you can see them softer. Yeah. So, not this size. So, you didn't resize them? No, I resized them. So, I resized them to um, 224. That one, one uh, side of the picture has to, uh, have, to have 20, 20, 224. Because you can get uh, not squares, you can get rectangles. And then when you get have a rectangle and one of the side has 224 pixels, you crop the center of it to have a square. Okay, any more questions? Yeah. <laughs> but to uh, learn the position of the logo. So, so you want to train a classifier to localize logo inside a picture, right? No, because it's, it's uh, interesting, if I understand it co correctly, because I used the sliding window uh, approach, which is very naive. And I um, think which is better and is used right now is to um, so-called region proposal. And you have a network that is trained to propose you a region and you don't check naively everywhere. Some other question? Okay, let's thank Mukesh. Okay, thank you very much.